Thank you for joining us. We're here in the studio today to talk to Walter and Sonika Feit. Welcome, Walter and Sonika. Thank you. Walter is one of our main speakers at Amazing Discoveries, and we've been together for quite a long time, 20 years, ever since Amazing Discoveries started. But you've been preaching longer than that, I believe, some 28 years? 28 years, more or less. And you've preached uh, around the world to, in many countries. Your Tolasa series has been seen by countless people, and we've even had stories of people who've watched the series and just walked into the church ready to be baptized and join the church. And we won't know until heaven exactly what the fruits of your labors will be. But you've had a lot of opposition as well over the years from many areas, many people who have come into your life. And our viewers have seen your life story. They've heard it, probably most of them. But just for those who haven't, we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to hear exactly how God has led you through your lives. You must have fascinating lives to have been able to persevere in over all this time preaching the three angels message. So Walter, why don't you tell us first about your family and your childhood? Family and childhood. Well, I grew up in a home where my father was Roman Catholic and my mother was Protestant. And my father at one stage, according to my sister, I was too young, but according to my sister, my father was going to go into the priesthood. But uh, he met my mother and that changed his point of view. And so he dispensed with that. But the only problem was that she was Protestant. She was Lutheran, right? Yes, she was a Lutheran mm -hmm. and she belonged to the German Lutheran Church in South Africa. And she was one of twins. And when they got married, my mother desperately wanted a double wedding because her sister was also getting married. The only problem was they were Protestants and my father was Catholic. So in order to do the right thing, my father married my mother in the Catholic Church and then went from the Catholic Church directly to the Lutheran Church for the double wedding to participate in that. Now in those days, that was before Vatican II, so that was a no-no in Roman Catholic circles. And I don't know exactly what happened, but he never ever attended Mass again after that although he regularly went to church, and I went to church, and I was raised Catholic, but he never ever attended Mass again. So there was some altercation. And uh, the next thing that happened that is important is that when I was about eight years old, my mother contracted cancer. And they weren't so good with their, their treatments in those days. And so she had many operations. They had a mastectomy and then a colonoscopy. They took the colon out. They eventually, she just deteriorated. But over a long period of time, she had radiation. They even forgot her in the, in the radiation. Oh chamber and she was terribly burnt and so, tremendous suffering over many years. They gave her only a few months but she stretched it to four years. Mm. Now I was attending the German school in South Africa at that stage. I don't even know whether I should mention which school it was but uh, that's history. And there I had instructions during the religious instruction period with the Roman Catholics. So the Roman Catholics went to one room, but the bulk of the church was Protestant Lutheran. And so we had totally separate instructions. The bulk of the school was actually Protestant? The bulk of the school was Lutheran, yes. And of course, there you are subjected to all the doctrines that are associated with this. And this particular nun that was giving us the religious instruction, she was very adamant that uh, because of my mother being a Protestant and she being sick, she probably was concerned and in her special way wanted to influence me, to influence my mother to become a Roman Catholic 
because outside of Roman Catholicism there was no salvation and therefore she taught me that my mother was going to go to hell. At one stage I even had a little bottle of water from Lourdes which she gave me because this has healing abilities according to them and I was to somehow pour this on my mother and I still remember thinking how am I going to pour this on my mother without her noticing it and so I sort of opened this bottle oh, I don't know how old I was, maybe nine and went to her and talked to her and leaned over her and spilt it on her and she said what the heck's going on here and I said, oh sorry, sorry but it didn't do anything, it didn't, certainly didn't help but as time went by I got more and more agitated because why should she go to hell just on the basis of being a Protestant? She was a very God-fearing woman. She believed in God. She would recite the Psalms. She prayed. And uh, there was never any religious argument in our home. My father tolerated her Protestantism. She tolerated his Catholicism, I don't know whether they knew the details of what each one was believing, but there was never any religious argument. But this issue just kept growing. And uh, finally I got very angry with the nun, and I got very angry with God. And occasionally the nun would come to our house and go and visit my mother, who was bedridden at that stage and every time my mother would end up in tears because she was working at her, she had to become Roman Catholic and she didn't want mm. to give up her faith. And at one stage my father actually found out about this, that my mother was so upset and so he escorted the nun out of the house most unceremoniously <laughs> to my great delight but uh, Anyway, that's history. One day I was sitting in religious instruction and she was again telling me that it's so unfortunate that my mother was going to go to hell and I lost my temper and I took the catechism book and I tore it up, which is a very sacrilegious thing to do and I threw it at her <laughs> and explained to her in my 10-year-old language at that stage or whatever it was what she could do with her God. Oh, that created a major furor. I was thrown out of the religious instruction class. Which I'm sure you didn't mind. <laughs> no, I didn't mind. But I was very rebellious by now. And then I sat there in the, in the corner, in, the, in a sort of a courtyard, an amphitheater with a school and the, the walkway of the school was right past that amphitheater so any teacher or anyone who goes by will sit, see me sitting out there. And the headmaster, he used to come by and then he'd see me there and he'd call me and say, what are you doing out here? And I would say, that explicit woman threw me out. Uh, at which point then he would proceed to modify my posterior, take me into corporal punishment, well punishment was of course part of, of it course, in those yeah. days, so you would get six of the best or three of the best and the maximum that you were allowed to get was six of the best and I don't know but maximum seemed to be the appropriate punishment for me every time. The norm. The norm and obviously they discussed me in the tea room as being this impossible child and so some of the other teachers had the same attitude and I remember one teacher in particular he would uh, before he even started his class if class would sit and he would say he would say if I come here and he'd give me a crack in the face hit me across the face said get out I don't need your kind in my class go and sit outside and invariably the headmaster would catch me and give you more. And give me more. And I hated him. And I mm. started to hate school. I wouldn't study. Because after all, when you're a kid, who are you studying for? Not for yourself, right? You're yeah. studying for these teachers and to please them. 
And so I became very rebellious. I remember one time the headmaster, very angry, was furious. And he gave me the six of the best and then he wanted to give me the seventh one just as an extra bonus. And I was bent, I refused to cry. I just bent over, grit my teeth. And then I'd say to him, one more please, one more. And he'd, he'd get very angry. And I'd say to him, please, one more. And then he'd stop. And I'd say, that's a pity, because if I had seven strokes, I could go to the police and show them my seven strokes. And you would be in trouble, because you can only give me six. But you're a coward, you don't give me seven. And so, you know, I wasn't popular no. at school, not no. at all. Eventually what happened, uh, my mother died. And then my father, not long thereafter, married another lady who turned out to be a fairy tale stepmother. She didn't like you. No, she didn't like me, but I don't blame her. I mean, I was an impossible child by then. And uh, I hated school with a passion. I would, I would dream at night how to destroy schools and how to liquidate teachers. But uh, fortunately, I never got round to that. But I did, did have my revenge on certain schools, any school. I think you did. I think I did, yes. I used to make huge catapults from trees and put stones on them and shoot them into the air onto the roofs of these schools and break the tiles and do stuff like that. And I once manufactured a bomb. It was quite an experience. I had to go from chemist to chemist <laughs> and buy all the different components and they would ask me, why do you want sulfur? No, my mother needs it for the roses or something like that. And why do you need this and why do you need that? And then I'd manufacture this thing. And I still manufactured in an old um, baking soda can because my father was a baker. I manufactured it was about that big and I dug this huge hole under a tree on a school ground and put it underneath and then set my fuse and went running. And I didn't expect it to be such a huge explosion. I thought it would just be an interesting pop. <laughs> but the whole tree, which was a huge tree, blew out of the ground and ended up on the, on the sports field. <laughs> now, fortunately, when this thing went off, nobody saw me. Everybody went running to see what was happening. And I figured out, if I run away, I'll be in trouble, so I'll run there. So I ran like crazy. It was one of the first days. I said, what happened here? What happened? And everybody was looking around. Nobody knew what had happened. So that was my schooling. So then when my father remarried, it was time for me to go to the boarding school. I had to leave home because this impossible child uh, had to get some training in school. So I went to the boarding school, which was even more of a nightmare because now I was in the boarding school at this very school that freaked me out. And so eventually I couldn't handle it anymore, so I used to run away and I used to run into the mountain. Was this the school where you sat in the trees and threw pine cones? Yes, it was right up against the mountain and there was a forest behind it. These days the forests are all gone. I don't know what happened to the forests, but those were all massive pine forests on the slopes of, of Signal Hill and Table Mountain. They were all forested. And then they would have search parties and come and look for me and I would climb into those trees and when they, when they saw me I would grab the pine cones and pelt the teachers. <laughs> and so finally they decided uh, I was not schooling material. I had to go and learn some trade or something like that. Was it your uncle? Who helped you out? Mm, my uncle helped me out then because mm -hmm. when they said I have to go away from school, then of course my rebellious nature decided the opposite. Whatever they said, if they say A, I, I say B. Now my uncle was a headmaster at another school and so I went to him and asked him, can I come to your school? And he said, 
no, no, I don't think that's a good idea. But he took pity on me and he arranged for another school. And so I attended that school, which was an upper class English school. The teachers were fine, but I decided I'm going to be a model student. I'm not going to cause any trouble. I'm definitely not going to blow holes in this school because I'm here now because I want to be here. And you have to stand in rows in those days and go in and this one kid, he just kept badgering me and he'd walk past me and, and ram me with his shoulders against the wall and he'd call me a Nazi and a German and a this and a that. And I, I took it for about three months which is a, a world record. <laughs> and uh, one day <laughs> he came past again and he, I wasn't prepared for it. Normally I was prepared, you know, and you, you're, you're waiting for it and you can see it coming and you're all right. He bat, bashes you and you go up against the wall, but you're Brace prepared. Yourself, yeah. But I was talking to someone and I didn't notice and he came and he rammed me against the wall and I hurt myself. And... Uh, it was time for action. So I grabbed the poor boy, dragged him into the classroom, opened the desk, put his head inside and closed it unceremoniously. And his nose was somehow out of joint. It sort of stood sideways. I broke the poor kid's nose. And so I thought, oh, I'm out of here. I'm out of school. I've lost it. The headmaster called us in and... Uh, he was actually a very wise man. He was called the boss, so children had respect for him. And he got the whole story and eventually he told the poor kid that he'd had enough punishment. He will have to go and see to his nose, but he has to stand outside and wait so that he could hear what my punishment would be. And I thought, well, what's going to happen now? So he said to me, I should really expel you because I don't take lightly when people mm -hmm. fight in my school and do this sort of thing. But I will give you one more chance. You will get caning. So he went to his cupboard and he was, a, I don't know, a perfectionist, but he had a whole cupboard full of different canes. So he took out a rather broad one and bent it, he, he used a, a psychological warfare mm -hmm. and he bent it and he put it back and he took another one and about the fourth one it was very flexible and just perfect and by this time the kid of course was sweating yes. right so he bent it like this and then he came up to me and I was sitting on this side of his desk and his desk was on the other side and his chair was there and as he walked up to the desk, he went like this. And then he whacked the back of his chair six times. And then he said to me, and whispered, when you go outside, hold on to your posterior. <laughs> and uh, he gave me a little lecture about how he thought that you know, the months of badgering that I had was enough punishment for me too. But for the sake of the fellow listening outside, this was a necessary procedure. Mm -hmm. So I went outside holding my posterior, pulling my face, which satisfied the other party. And that was the end of it. So that actually gave me respect for teachers and schools again. They weren't so bad after all, at least some of them. And that was my schooling. Then I went after school, I went to the army. And after the military training, I decided I needed to go to university. But I didn't have any money. And uh, my stepmother wasn't in favor of any further studies. After all, I was a, a troublesome kid. So I decided I'll go by myself. And so I attended university and worked in the evenings and worked on weekends and got a job as a waiter and tried to pay my schooling and it worked but I got a little help from a relative here and a relative there and eventually when things started to get really 
better at university than my father would secretly help me as well. So that helped. And there at the university I had a roommate and he became one of my best friends. And we studied together and did things together. And sometimes I couldn't find a job over a vacation period. And where was I going to go in that vacation? I had no place to stay. I couldn't go home. I wasn't welcome with my stepmother. And so I used to go home with him sometimes. And uh, that's where I met his sister. Which is? Who was sitting right next to me. Yes. And having realized that she would make a much better roommate than him, I kicked him out and married her, and that's how we are together. So that was my background. Because of all the religious turmoil, I decided God is for the birds. Mm -hmm. I don't need God. And at university, I studied zoology, evolution. So I became an atheist and an evolutionist, and that was my religion. And if somebody should talk to God about me, th that was it. That was the end of the conversation. But I think uh, so you now should we, say something. Now we need to hear from Sonika and see how she grew up. Well, I had a very different upbringing. My, my grandmother was very religious, but my parents were total atheists. And so much so that my father actually went into the occult and he tried to understand the mysterious other world that, that you know, the supernatural world. And he went into so many different things, Scientology and um, he did, I don't know how many, 300 or something seances. Mm. And um, we were sort of drawn into it, but somehow there was, I was never actually interested. I was never, I never wanted to explore that, that world. And so um, my father used to say very, I can remember so clearly uh, on Sundays, the, the uh, church goers would walk past the house and they would walk with their Bible under the arm and he would say, don't ever go to a church. They'll just indoctrinate you. They'll brainwash you. It's all rubbish. And this somehow, I started to think about, you know, what is there in a church that, that, you know, is so forbidden, you know, and I used to go from one church to the next um, when they weren't there and we, were, we grew up on our own because my parents were both working. So during the day I was totally alone and uh, when my brother was there, but we sort of we were, I was more in the streets than in our home. I was walking the streets all the time. And so I used to go and try and go to one church. There was a, um, what was it, Doper Reform Church? Of Reform, Dutch Reform? Dutch Reform, but, but uh, the Reform. The Reform, Dutch, Dutch Reform. Reform. Yeah. And um, I used to try and get in there and it was all locked. And then I'd go to the next church, a Baptist church. I couldn't see inside. I was so curious to know what is inside a church. Why wasn't I allowed to go there? And it was, it was strange. I was never able to get into a church. And then my, my brother was, my brother had a, a, like a defect kind of a, you know, um, he was born, he wasn't actually born with it, but at three years he started to go lame on the one side. And they did many operations, and so he was very insecure, and he was he was almost like he was uh, trying to take out everything out on me, and I I had so much trouble, you know, at home alone with him. So I used to just run away from home, and then one day I found this little church. There was a tiny little chapel, and I went in there, and there was, it was open. And I went inside and it was just quiet and I sat there and I started singing. And it was so beautiful. I just enjoyed the, you know, the, the acoustic and the, the sound and I started singing. And that way, that's where I actually started enjoying music and religious music. I, wasn't, I didn't know God. I didn't know anything about the Bible. Nothing, nothing, knew nothing. And, um, but you were drawn to these churches. I was drawn all the time. to it, yes, yeah. for some reason. And um, 
yeah, in the meantime, things were happening in our home and we always had, you know, it was almost natural that there were always ghosts or, you know, things happening in the house. The, the, the sticks would rattle. Um, my, my grandfather had walking sticks and my mother kept them in, this, in the house after he died. And these, rattle, these things would rattle. And she would just say, oh, grandfather's here, you know. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, yeah, we, they would, we would have a, a, an easy chair, a nice chair, where my grandfather used to sit sometimes. And after his death, this chair would sort of, you could actually see it moving and you could hear somebody breathing. And yeah. I, I didn't see it as scary. It was normal. Um, that was the way we were brought up. Um, yeah, and then at one stage, because of, you know, this, this conflict that I had, my brother was intimidating me and I was becoming more and more, you know, introverted. I started, I had a speech problem. I couldn't speak. And my father sent me to Scientology, you know, instead of, you know, trying to find out what the problem is. He's, he said, um, oh, Scientology will sort you out, you know. And I was 12 years old and he sent me to this organization. I had to take buses and go all the way into Durban. We lived in, in Durban in, in the, on the east coast of South Africa. And um, this was the most scary thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. They, they put you, you have to go through certain levels and you have to pass the first level and pass the second level. and. I think the third level and then you sort of can go up to the very advanced level and you have to pass the first three before you can go through the others. But how do they pass? Don't they yes. give some meters? You get like, it's like little uh, cans that you hold and they attach, there's wires attached to them and it's attached to a, a meter and they call it an e-meter and it's basically I think it's just a lie detector. It's, it's basically what I think what it is. So when they, then the, the person sits there on the other side of the table with this meter and you sit on this side and then they start asking you questions and they ask you personal questions and really things that, that you don't feel comfortable with. And I don't know why, I don't, really don't know why they did that, but you have to then get over this. And then this e-meter would register whether you are lying or not, mm -hmm. or whether, whether there's something in you that has to be cleared, a karma or a whatever. Um, and it was, to me, it was, I was so scared because they were reading my thoughts. That's what I thought. At 12 years, I thought this meter could read my mind. And I was, I just refused to work with them. And, and then eventually they phoned my father and they said they can't do anything with me. <laughs> and I must, and then my father said, well, just put her through to the, the top level. And at the top level, they had steps, um, 10 steps that you have to go through. And what I got out of it as a 12 year old, I didn't understand too much, but I realized that if, if you reach the top step, you actually become God. Mm -hmm. And then you can do anything. Then you don't have to be scared of anything. You can, you can conquer everything, your fears, everything. And so I can't remember actually if I went up there, but I just knew that I, d I wasn't interested. And it didn't help me in any case with my speech problem because I still had, I couldn't speak. When we met, he had to speak for me. I couldn't speak. I couldn't get really? any words out. I was, I was uh, totally dumbstruck. And he had to do all my speaking for me. He could talk to me, okay. no problem. But not to anyone else. Anyway, so we, I went through life that way. Um, yeah, and that was my childhood, basically. And then did you go to school, university? I went to university when I left school. Um, I went to Stellenbosch University where he was, and that's where I actually met him before that, but but that's where we started to date, basically, and um, got married in my second year. And, um, yeah, it was quite an experience because I came from this very different background and he was this, this bold, forceful German 
and I felt very intimidated by his family because they were also very German and very uh, bold. My stepmother was very kind to you, wasn't she? <laughs> yes, his stepmother was was quite something else because he told me he doesn't want to take me to his parents because he's scared that she would make me you know, feel bad. And I said, oh, it couldn't be that bad. And so the first meeting we had with her, um, she, the very minute I walked into the home, she said to me, oh, so you are the one who's going to, um, I'm not going to say all the details that she said, but, but she said, basically, you're the one who's going to marry him and then you're going to inherit everything that actually belongs to me. Mm. And you're just a slut, you're just a bad person. And, um, and I started crying and I, I really didn't... Very intimidating. It was very intimidating. Yes. So, yeah, we didn't go there often. And we just started on our own. We just carry, carried on. So on you were both non-Christians? Non-Christians. You both um, started your married life and then yes. you had some children? Well, before that, we, I got a, a, my first university teaching post. I got it in Durban. And I was in Stellenbosch in the south, or we were, because that's, that's where she went to university. We got married in our second year, and so what now? I've got a teaching post in Durban. So we decided that we would do that, and then she would try and study further at Natal University. And so we moved to Natal, and that's about almost 2,000 kilometers away from where we were. But they wouldn't allow her to do a final year in another university. She had to have at least two years in a university to get a degree. So we had to defer that until a later stage. But an interesting story is, we moved into a, a house, and my father actually was secretly helping us because she bowled my father over. He took one look at her and decided, <laughs> I don't care what opposition I get, and uh, he liked her. He liked her. He liked her. Anyway, so he helped us a little bit and we moved into this house. Now, her father, remember, was a cultist mm -hmm. and he was, at one stage, he was investigating for a newspaper. He had incredible experiences. I mean, horrendous experiences, occult experiences. And initially, he wouldn't believe it like a little newborn baby. The people would put it to bed and then the baby would scream like crazy. And then the baby, when they come in, was not in the little bed anymore, but on top of the cupboard. And as they come into the cupboard, the baby starts falling down from the cupboard and they run and they catch the baby. And he thought there was some hocus pocus there, so he came to investigate and he sealed all the windows put seals on them, locked the door, put these cameras up, whatever, for the newspaper. And then the baby would scream. And he would unlock the door and go in, and lo and behold, the baby was on top of the cupboard. I mean, really strange occurrences. Or they'd put a little girl to sleep in another house. She didn't want to sleep. What was the shoes that came walking? Slippers, I think. Slippers. slippers. And the slippers would come walking oh. in by themselves. And all of these occurrences, and in one seance, the spirit was talking, and he thought there's a hidden microphone here somewhere. And so he was looking around for the microphone, and the spirit said, uh, there's an unbeliever here. If you don't stop with your unbelief, you will have to face the consequences. So he was even more interested, you know, where is it? And he was looking at, and the next minute, something grabbed him, and dragged him outside the building and gave him a blow on the head that he had a huge welt on the top of his head. Now, if something grabs you and throws you out and gives you a whack, then uh, you start your unbelief in a hidden microphone sort of evaporates, right? So that's how he was drawn into occultism. Mm. And he actually started 
the New Age movement in South Africa. He was one of the first. Mm. Now, unfortunately, your mom and your dad separated. Mm -hmm. And he married again, and he married a high occult lady who was a medium and was very steeped into this and used to have audiences with spirit beings. So that's their background. So while we were living there in Durban, it was only one year that I was there, then I got a job at Stellenbosch University, which I had to take because then she could finish her degree, right? While we were living there in that house, we had such horrible experiences, it's unbelievable. We would lie in bed, and what would happen? Oh, yes. We would hear... We would hear um, in the kitchen, we'd done all the dishes in the, and it was in the dish rack and we'd hear all the dishes fall down. And we'd, we had a, a Rottweiler, a nice big dog, and she would run and go and check it out and, and there would be nothing. And this happened a couple of times and we once had a group of people that came for dinner and my brother was there and he said, what's going on in your house? The glasses are jumping off the, off the table onto my foot. And things like that. And we got a little bit more scared. I was, he was, he was petrified. Because Me? He, yes. Because right. he, he hadn't grown up with this and I was more used to it. But the, uh, the strangest things, we had one accident after the other, ma bashed the car and... Things happen. But strange things. I'd, I'd drive into the driveway and stop my car in the garage and we're still both in the car, in the car when the next moment the car, whole car lifts up and smashes against the wall, sideways. It, it was unbelievable. There's many things, yeah. We would break um, behind a car and the car wouldn't stop and we'd just go into the car. So did these demons follow you to your new house from your parents' house? Well, we didn't know what it was. Um, in Africa there's a lot of um, voodoo and so people were saying that somebody had cursed um, us or cursed mm -hmm. our house or whatever. We, we, we didn't know what it was and we actually asked my father to come and you know, so we told my father and he said, oh, no problem, I'll sort it out. So he brought his garlic and his <laughs> garlic. <laughs> garlic and uh, I can't remember what else was it. Some um, signs. And oh, signs, <laughs> yes. He made some signs. I'm not going to repeat the signs that he made in the corners of the house. And he said, um, did you have an argument with your gardener uh, or someone? And we said, no. And he said, well, maybe they just, you know, cursed you or something. There is, uh, of course, it is very often that, that, that they would make it a little doll of you and they would, they would um, stick needles in it and, and bury it somewhere in your garden. Oh. And um, that's what he said would probably happen. And so we, we weren't sure. We didn't know about demons. We didn't know about the the spirit world or anything like that. You thought it was just normal? We just... She thought it was normal, I thought it was scary. Mm. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, we would hear these things crashing in the house, like plates flying mm -hmm. against the wall, breaking. And the dog used to sleep on a mat next to us and she'd go ballistic and she'd go running and coming back and lying down, nothing there. And every time these things happen, I sit upright, my hair starts tingling, but she's just fine, it used to irritate me. <laughs> and then what happened, it got so bad that it was almost unbearable to live in the house. We'd sort of sneak <laughs> into the house, we were scared to go into the house. And she still had some of her things in boxes, because we didn't know exactly how long we were going to be there. And she had a black stuffed cat, right? Who made that? Your My great aunt. She, was, she made dolls and puppets and, and stuffed animals. She had given this to her. And these things were in sealed boxes up in the top cupboards. And one night we'd visited her parents 
and we come back in and we sneak into this house <laughs> and we go to bed and I open my bed and here is the black stuffed cat oh. on my bed, on my side, under the blanket. Scary. That's very scary because how did it get there? There's nobody in the house, couldn't have been anyone, it was locked, it was in a sealed box, the box wasn't open, how did the cat get there? And, and a black cat. And a black cat at that. And this totally freaked me out and I couldn't handle it. And I said to her, oh, we need help. And your father's hocus pocus is not working. And all his occult connections, they're not doing anything. And you know what the Jesuits say, give me a child until he's eight year and I have him forever. Mm -hmm. Now I'm an atheist and an evolutionist. But I say to her, you know what, maybe the Catholic Church can help. Because you know they have exorcists yeah. and all of this stuff. I'm going to look for the Catholic Church. So off I go and I go there. Where was it? In Clough or where? Yeah, I went to the Catholic Church there, met the Catholic priest and said to him, we have this problem. And he said, no problem, I'll come to your house. So he came to our house and he had his little book there and he was reading the exorcist prayers and he had some holy water and he did basically what her father did. He went to each corner and he sprinkled the holy water and off he went. And he said he thinks the problem is solved. And that night we're lying in bed and it's dead quiet. Nothing happening. Now, very apprehensive. Looking around. Nothing. Deadly silence in the house. And we had a, a long passage and a door that was open to the bedroom because we were the only two in the house. Why lock it? And the next minute, heavy footsteps come down the passage. And I'm sitting there, my hair's going... <laughs> and the dog... And the dog goes berserk. She runs towards the door and she's barking and barking at the passage. And then she stopped and she just looked and she turned around and she came back. And then the steps came up to the door, but there was nothing there. And then three hard knocks against an open door that we could see because it opened into and it just went ba ba ba. And then there was it. It never came back to the house. So it's almost as if some spirit entity was saying, okay, you got me. Goodbye. I'm out of here. Goodbye. I just wanted to know it was me. And then uh, I got this other job. I was only there for a year. And we left. Just before we left, everything went wrong between my mother and my father. And she tried to commit suicide. Mm. And it was also an absolute nightmare. We had to race her to hospital. And the first hospital wouldn't take her. Um, because it was a suicide case and the next one um, we had to drive what 30 40 kilometers yeah. at high speed and we just just saved her life and you were minutes. you were I was, expecting I was eight months pregnant and it I nearly lost that or nearly went into labor so that was and that was very stressful to be there and we were very relieved to go back to, to Stellenbosch away from that place. Anyway, so then we got back to Stellenbosch and I got my new position and uh, my university career was launched and the first child was born and the next one, but our children are quite far apart, they're almost four years apart. And then finally the third one. So we had quite a number of years of normal sat settled life. Uh, she had finished her degree, she she was she was doing fine. And uh, so everything had normalized. Everything's normalized. And then the final event. Our youngest child. But first, our f my father I... separated from my mother 
uh, they got divorced and he came to live with us. And he lived with us for th almost three years. And then this started happening. So the same things that happened in the other place started happening in our house. Now, not to the extent that things were flying around, but much more serious. It was as if she was under constant attack. And so she had tremendous problems. She got very, very sick. She ended up in a hospital many times. They wanted to terminate the pregnancy. And uh, we refused to terminate the pregnancy, especially after they did a scan and you can see the little fetus mm -hmm. developing there. So we didn't want to terminate the pregnancy. And it was touch and go whether she would live or whether she wouldn't live. And she coughed and she coughed and she coughed for nine months. And then when the little one was born, he was a very miserable little fellow. <laughs> he used to scream and scream and scream and we didn't know how to handle this. So you remember what you did? You used to rock yes, him. Yes, yes. You could not, he wouldn't stop screaming. So you couldn't even feed him without m movement. So you had to constantly push the stroller and um, yeah, you couldn't do anything without keeping him happy and, and he was just screaming constantly. Eventually we got him so far that he would, if he fell asleep, he'd be in his own little room next to us, right next to us. And then one night at two o'clock in the morning, I had a terrible nightmare that I was being strangled. And we had a digital clock on our bed and it said two o'clock. And I sat up in bed and I was perspiring and it was very realistic, it was horrible, like somebody is killing you. And the next minute this little child screams like you cannot believe. And we both jumped out of bed, ran, pick him up and he gets fever cramps. And it, it virtually stops breathing. So we're stressed like crazy, we rush him off to hospital and they, they battled to save him. And eventually he got such high fevers, they put him into a sort of a re refrigerated cot with cold air blowing upon him. And they put the intravenous fluids into him and, and then he'd recover. And he'd come back home two or three weeks later, exactly two o'clock at night, same dream. And then he would scream. And the same drama all over again. Back to hospital, fighting for his life. It was, it was a total nightmare. And one after the other. It happened frequently. Yes. How many for times? How I don't know. Many, like, many times. Many times. His folder must have been like this at the hospital. Now, you know what? Kids get sick. Kids get fevers. But exactly two o'clock at night, repetitively, over and over and over again, if it happens once, twice, three times, five times, ten times, then it's no longer chance. Mm -hmm. Then it's something else. And every time it's a life and death struggle, we were total wrecks. We were totally finished. And I still remember I was marking scripts. It had just happened again and he was in hospital. And we took turns sitting in hospital through the night. And I was sitting there and I was petrified of two o'clock. Two o'clock was a no-no for me. Mm -hmm. And I was marking scripts from the medical students in the middle of the night. These poor kids, I don't know whether I was compass mentis, but I was marking them. And two o'clock was coming and I'm sitting in the hospital opposite this little cot with this little kid in it. And it's two o'clock and I'm marking. And when the clock struck two o'clock, the child started screaming in that bed mm. and getting like fever cramps. And I ran to fetch the, the medical staff. And now we're trying to, to stabilize him. 
and to get more intravenous fluid into him, but he's, he's in such cramps, at that stage they couldn't find the, the, the veins and the arms anymore, so they put the intravenous into a vein on the head, and somehow he ripped it, and he ripped it out sideways. Mm -hmm. Now, a head wound bleeds terribly. It made it even worse. There was blood all over. I was splattered with blood, and they're trying to do this, and then the horrible two o'clock goes past and he relaxes again and they get it all together again but that night I decided I need help this is this is beyond natural and I remembered what happened in our house from the priest from the priest I said ah maybe the Catholic priest can help me mm -hmm. And so I waited until she came, and she came at about six o'clock to relieve me. And I went to look for the Roman Catholic Church, and I found it. And I got there at about seven o'clock in the morning, and I asked where the priest is, and I found the priest. Now, I'm not saying this to be a derogatory, it just happened to be like that. But he was sitting that early in the morning with a brandy bottle in front of him and he was drinking. I don't know whether he was, you know, alcoholic or whatever. But uh, I looked at him and I thought, oh, what am I going to do now? And he sort of looked at me and says, yes, what do you want? And I said to him, you know, I'm a Roman Catholic, but I, I don't attend church or anything, but I really need some help. And he says, what kind of help do you need? And I said, well, there are very strange things happening in my house. And he says, stop. That's not my field. <laughs> and I said, good grief, not your field. What's, what, what's this? I said, You're a priest. This is, should be your field. He says, no, I'm not interested. Give me your number. I'll get a specialist to contact you. So he gave me his phone number. Well, I gave him my phone number and I went home. And then we were together and I still said, uh, well, that was useless. And the next minute we get a phone call and it's the chief exorcist of the church from the cathedral in Cape Town. Important man. And he says he's in the area, is at a particular monastery. Can we come and see him? So I said, okay, and I went alone. I went to him and he's sitting there opposite the desk and I'm talking to him and I say to him, uh, we have a serious problem at home and I was wondering whether you could help me. And before I can tell him what the problem is, he says to me, yes, I know. The devil is trying to kill your youngest son. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather, right? How did he know? I said, well, how do you know? He says, no, I just know. In fact, I've known for a week. Hmm. I said, excuse me, that's not possible. I only just went to the priest this morning. That's not possible. He says, oh, yes, we know. And then he said, uh, and your case is very serious. It's a very serious problem. We cannot do a normal exorcism in your house. We have to do a mass in your house. And for that, we need permission from the bishop. So I said, well, how long will that take? He says, well, normally it takes a while, but I already have it. And he showed me a letter. This must have impressed you very much. I was dumbstruck. And this was, this was unbelievable. And I said to him, uh, I don't come to church anymore. I haven't been to church in years, and my wife is, is not even a Catholic. She's Dutch Reformed, but she doesn't go to church either. And he says, well, that can change. Mm -hmm. He was very calm about it. And then he came to the house, and he met my wife now. What impression did you have of him? He seemed very dignified, very, uh, you know... Uh, very calm and I at that stage I was doing pottery um, I was teaching pottery at the college and 
um, yes, I, I thought constantly I was thinking, you know, we can't take this, that what he's doing for us, for nothing. Um, we're going to have to give him something for it. But, so he started taking out salt. He had um, holy salt, is that what mm -hmm. you call it? And he, I had to get water and he was sprinkling the salt in, in the water in a form of a cross, in the shape of a cross. And then he would put little salt crosses on the, on the windows. And it was strange to me, but, well, I just accepted it. And then you can tell further when he got to yeah. the he child's got, room. He got to the child's room. And as he was doing his thing with the water there in the child's room, putting his crosses there, suddenly something grabbed him. Mm -hmm. And he was shaking and like something was shaking him like a rag doll. And, and he wasn't a young man, he must have been in his 70s. And I thought, this man's going to get injured. And I tried to hold him and help him. And he carried on with whatever, and he was being thrown around, and eventually, <sighs> things stopped. And he went to the main bedroom, and he put his signs up there, and a little bit of activity, not as bad, and the other children. And then when he had done that, he took out some amulets, which he said were from Lourdes. And he said, each child must get one of these above his bed. So we put one above each bed on the on the window, uh, on the picture frame or whatever, hung one there. And then he said, but this child's room, that's the worst. We'll have to say the mass in this room. So he took off a ring which had a relic of a saint. Because every mass has to have a relic. And he put it on the little table that we put down for him. And he prepared everything to say a Mass in there. And we were standing there. And the next minute, there's a patter. And our dogs and our cat. We had two dogs. Rudy and I had two big Rottweilers. And a cat came running down the passage. <laughs> sat around the table. Mm -hmm. Very strange. Very weird. Very weird. And he said the Mass. And then he took off his ordination cross, took it right off his neck, and he gave it to us and said, hang this above the child's bed as well, which we did. And then he left, and you still gave him your pot. Yes, I had made a, a big, my best pot, and I thought this is the only way we can give him something, you know, for his trouble. And he said, I will take this pot and I will put it in... The, I will give it to the nuns in the convent that never see the outside world. And mm. uh, yeah. that was strange because I'd never heard of that, but yes. So off he went. And from that moment, problem gone. Solved. Now, this is strike two. Mm -hmm. Rome had solved my problem in the first house. Rome had solved my problem in the second house and I'm an atheist and so an unbeliever. What do you do about that? Well, I thought to myself, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite. And uh, so I discussed it with my wife. And how old was Martin then? Must have been about 12. Yeah, so the oldest child was about 12 or 11 by then. And I thought, well, this isn't good opportunity. If someone sees me in church, because I'm this macho atheist, if someone sees me in church, I can say, I'm here to introduce my, my children. And so we decided I'd go back to church. And she wanted to be a Catholic too, and wanted to join the Roman Catholic Church. And so I started going to church and became a very staunch Roman Catholic. Did everything that a good Catholic does, goes to confession, goes to Mass. Every Sunday I was in Mass. And she wanted to join the church. She came with us to the church. She thought it strange and mystical and all of these things. 
but uh, they'd solved the problem, right? And so we were regularly going back to church. And then what happened? With this peace in the home, this quiet, you get energy. And there were some things in our house that were irritating me. And being German, I looked at all of the structures that were in my way. There was a wall. I always had to walk around the wall. And I said, you know, this wall really has to go. Because then we have a nice open plan. And this kitchen is pathetic. And uh, so I took a nice big sledgehammer and sorted out the house. And started remodeling the inside. But we needed a new kitchen. My poor wife, I demolished the kitchen. So she had to cook on a... In the garage. In the garage. On a, on a gas cooker. <laughs> <laughs> For months and months. So I found a guy who was going to do the kitchen. And I found a German carpenter. I, knew, I wanted it precise. And so he arrived. And as he arrived with this new kitchen to put in the new kitchen cupboards, he said to me, I just want you to know that I walk with the Lord. And I looked at him and immediately those old feelings, this is a Christian freak here in front of me, a Jesus freak. And I said to him, well, that's fine. You walk with the Lord, but as for me, I just want a cupboard, okay? That's actually before I went to church, before I started going back to the Catholic Church. I was not yet in the Catholic Church. This was just a little while after the peace came into the house. And so he said to me, well, can I give you this? And he gave me something and it looked very religious and <laughs> normally I'd throw it in the waste paper basket but I threw it into a drawer and there it lay. And now these consciences started talking to us and I started going back to the church. So now a year later, I've been now in the church for, I don't know, nine months maybe. I'm lecturing, and I'm lecturing to the first year medical students. And I'm explaining the morphology of the kidney. And as is my custom, I explain the whole evolution of the kidney. And I'm writing on the board and showing where it developed and how it developed. And this young girl in the class puts up her hand and says, excuse me, Dr. Fight, I don't believe what you are saying. Now, that's like a hornet. Mm -hmm. I turn around and I say, what do you mean you don't believe what I'm saying? She says, I don't believe in evolution. I believe God created mm. it. That, that was it. I ridiculed her in front of that class. How you can be such an idiot so moronic as to not believe in evolution. I mean, evolution was a fact. There's no way you were going to get around it. And in fact, I'd even asked the Catholic priest, I'm an evolutionist. How does this, how's this going to pan out? You know, if I come back to church, you said, evolution's a fact, no problem. Mm. So I ridiculed this girl and she sat down and cried. So I thought to myself, Job well done. The rest of the students loved it, laughed about it, and thought she was a silly girl to make such a stupid comment. And I go back to my office, and I'm doing whatever I do in my office, and that little voice starts talking to me and says, you're a real member of the family, Sudi Dai, to which the pigs belong. How can you be so mean to this poor woman? I mean, she says she believes in God and you go to church, you're a real hypocrite. So my conscience started worrying me. So what does a good Catholic do when his conscience worries him? Go to church. No, he doesn't go to church. He goes to confession. confession. Goes to confession. I had to get it off my chest. So I thought, okay, it was just before lunchtime. And I'd finished my class and I was going home to take a bite to eat. I thought, I'll go past the Catholic Church, get this off my chest, done deal, then I feel better. So I get there to the church and I find the nun and I say, where's the priest? And she says, no, he's out shopping. But he shouldn't be long. And I thought to myself, inconvenient. 
I don't have much time. I have lectures in the afternoon. I still want to grab a bite of eat. I just want to get this off my chest. Where's the priest? No priest. So she says, wait in the church so long. So I'm sitting there in the church and I'm waiting for the priest. And the priest is not arriving. And I see the little red light burning over there. And that little red light tells you that the consecrated host is in there. That means that the Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, is in that tabernacle. So now I'm talking to God. I'm agitated. I'm talking to God. And I suddenly realize but I'm talking to a corpse, a corpus. That's why I can't talk to him directly. He's there, the consecrated host, but I have to wait for the priest. I can't get rid of my problem. I can't talk to God. And I'm thinking about all of this, and I'm thinking about the ritual. We go to church. The bell rings. You bow down. The bell rings. You stand up. The priest says, and peace be with you. And the congregation says, and with you. And, you know, everything yeah. is a ritual. And when you say a penance, it's ten Hail Marys, one Our Father, ten Hail Marys, one Our Father. And I'm thinking to myself, what kind of conversation is that with God? It's the same thing over and over. Doesn't he get bored with it? And uh, eventually I get so agitated and this priest is not arriving and I'm thinking about all this religion and I'm thinking, you know what? This is a lot of rubbish. This is a lot of rubbish. There's no communication with God. I have to wait for the priest and he's shopping. Mm -hmm. I'm done with religion. I'm going back to my normal atheism and be my normal obnoxious self. Off I go, I go home. And it was lunchtime. And then I had to go back to university and I was looking for something. But I can't remember what it was. You can't remember. But you knew exactly where it was, what I was looking for. She always knows where everything is. She said to me, go and look in that drawer. It's somewhere in there. I can't remember what it was. But I opened the drawer. And what is in this drawer but this pamphlet? So I whip out this pamphlet and I think, where's this come from? Ah, yes, that Jesus freak carpenter gave it to me. And I open it up for the first time to read it. And it says... The Roman Catholic Church changed the commandments of God. That's all it says. And then it had three sets of commandments. You open up the pamphlet, three sets of commandments. The commandments as they are in the Lutheran Catechism, the commandments as they are in the Bible, and the commandments as they are in the Roman Catholic Catechism. And I'm reading, scanning this, and I say, this can't be right. Nobody can just change commandments. And this is what the Bible says. But now I don't believe the pamphlet. Where, what proof have they got that it's different? So I grab the catechism because we had that. Because our kids went to catechism. So I grab the catechism and I open it up. And sure enough, it's exactly like it's on the pamphlet. Now I need a Bible. But we don't have a Bible. Catholics don't need Bibles. They have catechisms. So I asked her, have we got a Bible? Didn't have a Bible, right? No, we didn't <laughs> have a Bible. And I'm thinking, where am I going to get a Bible now quickly? I don't have much time. I need a Bible and I need it. What do I always say? Right, right now. now. I read it right now. And I remember this old lady who was a paraplegic. And we occasionally used to go and fetch her at the home and take her home so that she could just get out of this paraplegic home. And she couldn't speak and we, we took her for drives and took care of her occasionally because we were good people, if you know what I mean. Never murdered anyone, never did this or that. Took care of little old people like that. And when she died, she left her entire fortune to me which happened to be one box full of old German magazines, like Bunte and stuff like that. That was it. And what was I going to do with a little old lady's box? Throw it away. I didn't have the conscience to throw it away because that was her life. 
and she left it to me. And I didn't know what to do with the box, so I put it on the top shelf in the garage. So it struck me. Little old ladies might have Bibles. So I went to that box and I rummaged through it, and sure enough, here was a battered old German Bible. And I looked it up, and the commandments had changed. They were different. They were exactly like on the pamphlet, different from the Catholic version, and different from the Protestant version. And I couldn't understand this, so I thought, well, the carpenter must be able to explain it. So I found him, and I said to him, uh, you gave me a pamphlet, I want to know what's going on here. Can you come and explain it? Can I come to you? He said, no, I'll come to you. I said, okay, I'm back from university then, this evening. So that evening he arrived, and we went right through the book of Daniel. Right through the night till... Right through the night. About till four o'clock, five o'clock. Yeah. And then right through the book of Revelation, and here it was. And I said, well, this is incredible. And we did Daniel 7 and the little horn power. And here the Bible teaches that the little horn power is Catholicism. We would change God's law. And here they here the change God's law. And all the other features that apply only to Catholicism. Now, this can't be. This must be written after the fact. And so he said, no, the Bible is written so many hundreds of years, and this is sixth century before all these things happened. I, I wouldn't believe it. So I went to the theology department of my university, and I played squash with the professor of Greek. And I played squash with him regularly, and I went and asked him, and I said, what's this stuff here? And he confirmed, basically, what this carpenter was saying. And I said, I, I want to get into your library. I want to confirm whether this history is correct. Is this really a fact? And we went through it, and sure enough, it was a fact. And so we got back together and again, and I said to him, but, you know, the fourth commandment, that doesn't make any sense. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. Because it says you must keep the Sabbath because in six days the Lord created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything that's in it. And I said, that's ridiculous. You didn't believe in creation. No, what nonsense is this? Six days creation. There's no such thing. It's millions of years. He says, no, six days. I said, You're crazy. And then he came with a pile of books, right? He must have gotten them from the college. So he brought this pile of books, creationist books. So I'm reading these creationist books. And I've never read so much rubbish in all my life, from my perspective now. Give them back to him. I said to him, this is a lot of rubbish. He says, no, it's not. So he comes back with another pile of books. And I'm going through those books and I give them back to him. And we get into an argument. Now, good grief. I'm the scientist. I'm the evolutionist. I have a PhD. He's a carpenter. What does he know about evolution? And so finally... He got angry with me and he said to me, you know what, I don't have a problem with evolution. You have a problem with evolution. You solve it. So I had no argument against him anymore because basically he capitulated, right? It was up to you now. It was up to me. So I'm going back to the university and now I'm beginning to take out evolution books and starting to think about evolution. And I take out a book on paleontology. And as I take it out of the library, my colleague sees me with this book. And he says, oh, we've ordered the latest version of that book. It has arrived, but it's still in boxes. Let's go and see. Our department had its own library. So went back, opened the boxes, found the new edition. And for some reason, I took them both. Hmm. And I went to my office. And I started reading them together. I opened them on the same page because I thought, well, let's see what's different between the old edition and the new edition. What's the newest information? Is there something added or whatever? And I'm reading them together. And the old one says, when it comes to whatever animal group, the cetaceans or whatever, there are no intermediary fossils. Everything is based on the mindset and the theory. 
no intermediary fossils, no lineages between any of them. The new one says, this is the, the ancestor, and that's the ancestor, and this is the ancestor, but they don't fit onto the lines. So these are conjectures, but the old one is honest, whereas the new one covers it in scientific jargon. Mm -hmm. now, this makes me just a little bit suspicious. So I go through the entire book like this. When the professor comes in and he says to me, there's been a change in procedure, you will take the next evolution discussion class. Now that was a nightmare because the postgraduate students, they had a weekly discussion group on evolution issues and the, all the staff was present and everybody and the, and the students and the honor students and the master students and the PhD students and I used to do this regularly when it was my turn I would take some topic in evolution whether it was tachytele or bradytele, fast evolution, slow evolution whatever, I would, you know, present these facts and we'd have a discussion about it and it was great. But now, uh, there was something cooking in me. And I, at that stage I was doing the genetics course, again with the medical students. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do something different. And I started making a list of questions based on the genetics course that I was giving, not out of any book or anything, just questions as to how something could evolve or how gene systems could evolve if natural selection doesn't work on the level of the genotype but just on the phenotype then pure chance has to bring about the genetic development and what are the probabilities of these things happening so I started making a list of questions what's the probability of this happening that happening I had about 10 questions that's it it was only questions. And I gave this evolution discussion class and I said, today we're going to do something different. We're going to look at it from another perspective, a counter perspective, and ask some questions. And I started putting them on the board. And as I put them on the board, now remember nobody knows what's going on in my mind. As far as my students are concerned, as far as the staff is concerned, I'm an evolutionist, right? I've got all these questions. And this young girl gets up and she's a honor student. That means she's a first year postgraduate. And she looks at the staff and she points at them like this and she said, when I came to this university I was a Christian girl and I was happy in my religion. And now I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God and I've become an evolutionist. But as far as I can see from what is written on the board there, I've been deceived. Evolution is not possible. And pandemonium. Pandemonium. The one staff member got so angry he went red. He literally started foaming at the mouth. And he screamed at me. And uh, that was the end of that. So just ten little questions and I'd blown my career. My university career. So I went home. And I thought about it, and uh, at that stage I had Bible studies already, and we had Bible studies on death and the state of the dead and what spirits were, and that it cannot be the, the ghosts of deceased individuals. And we'd been through all of that. Oh yes, and these people that had come to give Bible studies... What happened to Robert? Do you remember? As we were starting the Bible studies. Oh, yes. He wouldn't tell that story. Yeah. Um, yes, when we started, every time we picked up the Bible, he would scream. He would start screaming. He was only about two years old then. And he would start screaming and cause some trouble. Um, at one stage, we were sitting in our lunch hour. He'd come home and we'd sit with the Bible. We were so eager and so hungry for understanding what the Bible is saying and we we were still we were had a, a wine every night so we still had a bottle of wine an empty bottle of wine standing there wine bottle 
and he suddenly just got angry or frustrated with us maybe and he smashed the, bi the, the bottle on the ground and he walked over it. So he nearly cut his whole toe off. And so then again, we couldn't study our Bible again and he was, had to go to the doctor again. And so constantly, as we were trying to understand what the Bible was saying, there was this constant opposition. Um, he was restless at that stage. And then one night at two o'clock, I had the dream again. Uh-oh. And he screamed. And we ran there and we thought, this is all going to start all over again. And instead of calling the Catholic priest, because I now had the Bible study on this issue, I called the carpenter. Mm -hmm. And the carpenter came and he brought a pastor from the church and he came and we prayed. We prayed about it. Nothing. Hocus pocus, no water, no spraying, no nothing. We just prayed about it and it calmed back down. And then when I was deciding, this can't be right, I'm battling with evolution, creation, this, that, same thing would happen. Not as bad that he had to go to hospital, but eventually we decided we'd make a decision. But on the point of decision, the phone rings. I ran down the passage and I picked up the phone. And who is it? The exorcist of the Roman Catholic Church. And I say to him, hello? And he says, you better get back to the Roman Catholic Church immediately. So I said, well, how do you know that I'm not even there? He says, I know. I remember what he knew before? Yeah. And then he says, uh, and by the way, your father, who was dead by then, is suffering in purgatory because of you. Now, of course, I knew that my father wasn't suffering in purgatory because the Bible knows nothing about purgatory. And the Bible says the dead know nothing. nothing and they'll have nothing to do under the sun. But I was curious. So I said to him, how do you know that my father is suffering in purgatory? And he said, uh, because the nuns told him. I said, well, what nuns told you? No, the ones who don't see the world. The one where the pot was mm -hmm. that my wife had made. And I said, well, how do they know? And they said, he said, the spirits told them. So I knew that they were holding seances, just like her father held seances, where the spirit world would talk. And the spirits, of course, are not deceased human beings. The spirits are, what does the Bible say? They are spirits of demons. demons that go out to deceive the entire world. So that is how he knew. That's interesting. So the demons that were terrorizing your home are the same demons that were talking to the nuns. The same demons. And yet the Catholics supposedly now, exercised Now, why, would, why did the problem stop in my home? Yeah. Now... Either the Catholic Church had the power to stop it, or they were being duped too. Mm -hmm. Maybe Satan thought that if I can get these people who are so evolutionary and all of this back into the church, I can mm -hmm. use them even better as mm -hmm. out there as atheists. Mm -hmm. And so all of this happened, and he just says, stand back. But one interesting thing is, if we take old pictures of this little child, his eyes, before and after we accepted biblical truth, different child, really? gentle eyes thereafter, and harsh eyes before. We take pictures of myself. One of my friends picked up, who was it? Francois. <laughs> Francois took up a picture, oh, is this your husband? And uh, <laughs> so, so this solved this problem to me as to how he knew what was going on in my home. And to be fair, when I discovered what the Bible said on the little horn, I wanted to be fair to them. So I actually invited the Roman Catholic priest to come to our house. And when he came to our house, I said to him, all right, here's what the Bible teaches. 
on the little horn power and the change of the commandments and the, the time period. And I gave him a history of all of that. And I said, now, what is your counter argument? And he looked at us and he says, I'm not into scripture. I'm not into scripture. What? And I said to him, excuse me, you're a priest. How can you not be into scripture? He says, we have specialists for that. So I said, well, thank you very much. And he left. And then I called a Methodist pastor. And he came with his elders to our house. And I said to him, now, what is your position on Daniel chapter 7? Who's the Antichrist? And he said, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, a Greek king. So now... Remember, I'd gone to our library and I'd studied the history and I'd seen all of this stuff and went, said to him, excuse me, you can't be right. So I went through the Bible study and showed that the Antichrist comes out of the fourth beast and not out of the third. So he cannot be Antiochus Epiphanes. It has to be Roman. It can't be Greek. And eventually he got so frustrated and one of his elders or deacons or whatever that he brought along became so interested and he was sitting like this and he was saying, that's interesting and that's interesting. So he got up, this Methodist pastor, and he closed the ears <laughs> of his, whoever it was that was with him and marched him out of my house. <laughs> so I'd given the Protestants a chance to explain their modern ideas. I've given the Roman Catholic a chance and both of them fell short of the biblical criteria. So I decided that this must be the truth. I was at work and my secretary gives me a document. Now, my secretary, I'd never discussed anything with her. She had no idea what was going on in my house or what was going on in my mind. She gives me a document, this thick, here. And I take this document and I say, what is this? She says, you must read this. So I'm reading it and it's a document on the Sabbath and why Sunday is the real day to keep. But I was busy with evolution books at that stage so I didn't have time for this document so I gave it to my wife. And what did you do with it? Well, I was very interested in anything now because now we were studying so hard. We were studying through the night sometimes and so I was studying with my Bible and this document and I was going through it and it struck me that everything that they had to support the Sunday keeping was from Bishop so-and-so and Father so-and-so and and I was wondering but where does it come it doesn't come from the Bible so I was searching in the Bible to try and find evidence you know um, for the Sunday and every time I opened the Bible, literally every time I just opened it, there were literally hundreds of or tens of texts that came out uh, about the Sabbath and how important it is to keep the Sabbath. And then I realized, but and the Ten Commandments, it just came out all the time. And I realized, but they don't, they they're not basing the Sunday on the on the Bible. And it made me think, and then I thought, well. I'm going to accept the, the Sabbath. So the document that was against the Sabbath? Yes. Made you accept the Sabbath? Yes. Yes. That's interesting. And then she says to me, the Sabbath is right. I'm going to keep the Sabbath. Because the Bible says the Sabbath and this document... Didn't prove anything. Doesn't prove anything mm -hmm. except what Bishop so-and-so said. In any case, the Bible says that you must listen to the Word and not to what some, some what the people say. But I wasn't ready to accept the Sabbath, so she was ahead of me. And, uh, and so now she wanted to go to the Adventist church. But me, I was still a little bit reticent, right? So one day, now people won't believe this, but it really happened. We're going to Helderberg, which is the big church. An Adventist church. Adventist church, yes. And this carpenter with his wife and his kids and me and her with our kids, we go to the church. 
but I don't really want to go to church. I'm not quite there yet. She's now read this document and she wants to keep the Sabbath. And I'm thinking still, you know, I have an evolution question or two here. I can't keep a Sabbath for millions of years. doesn't make any sense. It's ludicrous. And for you, it was very important because the Sabbath was a memorial of creation. That's right. And you had those linked and you wouldn't accept the Sabbath if you didn't accept creation. Cannot accept the Sabbath if you don't accept creation. If you accept creation, then you are the pariah of the scientific world. You are, you think you'll be ridiculed, mm -hmm. right? And who wants to be ridiculed in the scientific mm -hmm. world unless it's really important? So they're saying, all right, we're going to church and they're all getting ready and the kids are restless and, you know, they're not used to this sort of thing. So I said, you go, I'll take care of all the kids then you can go peacefully to church. So off they went to church. And I'm sitting with all these kids in their house waiting for church to come. Do you know how long these people go to church? These Adventists, they drive you nuts. They're in church forever. I mean, churches, I went to the Catholic church, 20 minutes, it's done over. deal. Go home, drink your beer, whatever. What's this nonsense? Hours and hours in church. <laughs> then there's Sabbath school, and then there's this, and then there's lesson study, and then there's a sermon, and, you know, it's a day. It's gone. So I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting, and I'm actually reading the Bible. And I'm reading the book of Job. And that's not a good book to read when you are beginning to question things in your mind. And I'm slightly irritated because it's taking so long. And I'm reading the book of Job. And here it says in the book of Job, And God said to the devil, I give you permission to touch Job. But you may not take his life. And so the devil touched Job and Job broke out in sores. And here was miserable Job covered in sores. And I look at this and I say, this is a lot of trouble. This is ridiculous. This is a fairy tale. One doesn't get sores from some devil touching you. A sore is a bacterial infection. It's a, you know what, it's a toxic outburst, whatever, or a staphylococcus or but definitely not some demon touching you and then you're full of sores. This is ludicrous. This is ridiculous. So I take the Bible and I'm actually angry and I throw it down there. And I'm agitated. Why are they taking so long? What takes so long in that church? <laughs> I take this Bible again and I read some more in Job. And the more I read, the more irritated I get. And the more agitated. And eventually... I take this Bible and I throw it down and play with the kids or something, but it drags me back. So I pick up this Bible again and it's a stupid thing. And I'm, Eventually I decide, as in the Catholic Church, this is, this is for the birds. This is ridiculous. This is so unscientific. It's pathetic. And I'm not going to be duped into believing some stupid fairy tale and then keeping Sabbath for some six-day creation when this is all full of nonsense. And these people are not coming out of church and I want to go home now and I'm almost ready to come and drag her out of church. And while I'm thinking about this, I'm aware that I'm experiencing pain. And I can't figure out what's going on. There's a burning pain on my left leg over here, just right there. And as I'm reading and arguing and whatever in my mind, the pain becomes unbearable. It's like somebody burnt you with a hot iron. And I'm thinking, what is this? Now, I can't pull my pants up because it won't go up to there. And I can't pull it down because I've got kids in front of me, their <laughs> kids, other people's kids. So I run to the bathroom, the washroom you call it, right? to rip the pants down to see what's going on with my leg. And here is a massive sore on my leg. It's not broken, but it's blood red. It looks like, I don't know what, what does it look like? It's red and slightly bubble, um, 
Nobly. Nobly. Yes, little bumps. And it's like it's on fire and the water is just running out of it. Now I'm oozing out of it. Now I'm in pain. <laughs> and I'm really struggling with this. And it takes I don't know how long until they finally come out of that church. And I grab the kids and I grab her and I said, we're out of here. And we're in that car and we're going home and I get home and I show her this thing and I say, what is that? Uh, what do you say? I've never remember. seen anything like it. That's what I said. I've never seen anything like it. It's not broken. The skin's not broken. But it's oozing some f liquid. And it's so so I cannot even, I cannot even move. And I'm saying to myself, no, no, there's something seriously wrong here. So I'm thinking, okay, okay, there, there's nothing that I know that's like that. And I mean, I teach medical students. I've never seen anything like that. I don't know about anything like this. This is definitely weird. And it came instantly, instantly. So this is not some infection that developed over time. And I'm saying, okay, okay, I'm willing to accept it. I'm willing to accept it. Maybe some devil touch job. <laughs> Maybe it's not so ridiculous. I'm, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm willing to accept it. So please forgive me that I thought that. Gone. Gone. Just like that. Just like that. Gone. And I'm thinking to myself, this is very weird. And then I say to you, you know what? We've gone crazy. We've gone nuts. <laughs> We've gone totally nuts. This is psychosomatic. This is psychosomatic. This is, this is idiocy. I think away from religion, it's nothing but trouble. <laughs> we'll can this religious, we'll put it on ice. She's Sabbath. She's now hooked on right. Bible. This. So we're, we're out of here. No more religion. Go back to our normal life. It was peaceful, none of this drama, back to normal. And as for this Bible, and as for Job, let's forget it. I don't believe it. Next second, there it, it is. It comes back. And it stayed for a whole week. I couldn't move, I couldn't walk, and eventually I said, I capitulate. And then it went. Well, unfortunately, Walter, we'll have to leave your story hanging right there. We have to take a break and we invite you to join us again next time to hear the continuation of Walter and Sonica's life as we find out how God has led them through their years.